Thanks, Jarl, for the kind introduction and uh, welcome after the coffee break. There is one free seat over here, <laughs> another one over there. So, if you want to sit. Um, so, I'm going to start with what we were doing in the last few months, years. Um, oh, it works good. Um, some time ago, I discovered in the archive, State Archive of Bern, um, a corpus, quite a large corpus of course, non-digitized and um, just paper, you know. Um, the char is, um, these are interrogation protocols. They were collected in the towers of Bern. So you have like verdicts and uh, of, of criminals and you have um, information about executions and you can rely on testimonies and stuff like that. So quite interesting, everything. The time frame is the corpus um, starts, the collection starts in the 16th century and it lasts until the late 18th century. And we then started doing transcriptions and we have manual transcriptions and they focus on the second and uh, the 16th century. The corpus size, and that's only what we actually are working with, is about 30,000 pages or more or less 9 million tokens. So the, the, the real size of the corpus is much bigger. That's just what we have managed to digitize so far. The language is early, high, no, early new high German and um, it's actually interspeased with a Swiss German dialect that causes some problems because that's not the same. Um, we have done annotations, they were student-led and um, they were partially um, checked, of course, um, especially the test set. So this is how it looks like. Um, on the uh, left side, you can see an early page. It's from, I think it's about 1580 or something. Um, you can see the stains on the side. Um, you can see the side notes. Um, so it is quite um, difficult to do um, HDR with stuff like that. And then on the right side, you have like a very neat and clean um, copy. Uh, yeah, I know this is basically a cleaned copy and you even have like small drawings. We have quite a few small drawings and they are also very interesting when it comes to analysis of this corpus. So um, we then, when we digitized uh, the parts of this corpus, um, we came up with some research questions and due to the size of the corpus, we were of course interested in which distant reading techniques um, we can apply on this corpus. Um, can we apply named entity recognition, for example, and POS tagging? A POS is in brackets because we did until now not succeed in uh, doing something which is reasonable and um, we have also problems with the non-normalized language and we wanted to test which influence do um, language models have. So we start with named entity recognition and the challenge was of course, as I said, the language is highly, highly irregular and it's high diversity and it's um, divergence um, compared to modern German. So we needed to come up with some solutions for, um, for that. And the goal was actually detecting names and entity, uh, named entities like persons, organizations, and locations. And the we, a second goal was um, the influence we wanted to check um, that language models have. And we were compare, we did compare BERT, FASTEX, and FLARE. And here is a tagging example. Um, Ismail is going to tell us how actually this works, but um, this is just that you see how it worked or it works at the moment. We have here a location tag and we have two person tags. There is no organization tag. That's actually quite typical. We, had, we don't have that many organization tag. A, because it's sometimes difficult to really say what an organization in this text is. And B, um, because as you remember, this is student-led. It was also for the students very um, hard to define what is an organization. So that's why they are sometimes absent, but we have some, of course. And with that, I hand over to Ismail. Um, thank you very much, Krista. Um, one second. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna give you, uh, give you an introduction to the experiments uh, we conducted. And because we don't want to leave anyone behind, I'm going to start with the, very quickly with the basics. Probably a lot of you are, know that stuff. Um, so how to train an ER model. Um, let's say you have your main corpus, in our case the tower books. Um, you, uh, tr first step, you want a good language model. You just want a lot of raw data. You, it doesn't need to be annotated. Um, to train that language model um, that holds all the information, how the language works. and you want uh, an architecture that can uh, perform sequence tagging for the named entity recognition. Um, so more concretely for our project, it looks like this. <laughs> so um, 
because the tower books by themselves, the part that is actually transcribed is very small. We uh, use uh, other corpora that uh, are from the same time with, uh, and from, with the same language, also from Switzerland, um, to uh, get more data. Sometimes we pre-process them a little bit to, to change some of the stuff where, for example, they had different transcription rules, so we try to make them fit better. And uh, we tested three different embedding algorithms. Uh, and finally, for the sequence tagger, we also used the Flare framework. I'm going to talk about Flare uh, in a second. Um, so this is from the paper uh, where they present their uh, language model architecture. The Flare, uh, Flare language model works like uh, many architectures with, an, uh, with a bidirectional LSTM, um, long short-term memory. And the thing is, it is character-based. Each character is treated as a unit. And basically, when you want the embedding for a word like here, Washington, then, then uh, this embedding consists of two actually separate embeddings, one of them being the hidden state at this point, which has all the contextual information of the previous characters up to this point, and the hidden state of the, of the other character, which has all the information of these characters. This is called the forward and the backwards embedding, which then combined are the embedding for the word in Flare. Now, the great thing about this is if there's a single character different, like it is in many times in medieval documents um, or early modern documents, uh, the embedding is not completely different, but just slightly different and will be afterwards in the uh, multidimensional space be very close to the other variant writing. So this works very well uh, already in the paper. It uh, shows, for example, that it works. Flair is extremely good for German because German is a language with a high, uh, high uh, variance uh, of different forms for the same, which actually have this, uh, similar meanings. Um, uh, yeah, and it uh, achieved uh, at its time state-of-the-art results and up to this day, at least for German, it can still keep up with uh, the transformer models. Now this is, of course, only the language model part. Then there's the sequence tagger part. That one is very simple. It is <laughs> just simply the, uh, what, was over, uh, like what was the standard for sequence tagging at that time, uh, bidirectional LSTM with conditional random fields as a classifier. So not too special there. So first, of course, we experimented with embeddings. Um, so uh, BERT, the most modern of those we tested, just didn't work for us. Uh, we suspect it's due to the very, very l small data uh, sets that we have avail available. Uh, fast text by itself was also scoring only ro low results. If you're not, if you don't know fast text, fast text use, uses subword embeddings. Why it's also not too bad for languages with uh, variants. Uh, Flair, though, just out of the box, already scored pretty well, good results on the small data set. Seventy-four point six percent F score which we can't complain about. Uh, Flare has a whole framework around it. It's very easily usable. Um, and you can stack other embeddings uh, together. So we tried uh, using the fast text model and a pre-trained BERT model for modern German to combine it with the Flare embeddings, but it made almost no difference. Um, from all these tests, we concluded that Flare at the moment for what we have, it works best. Uh, just to tell you something of a high variance, because maybe most of you are more familiar with pre-modern English, pre-modern German is very high variance. Uh, I did a clustering uh, for a short collection of documents, and I had different, 12 different writing variations for the word mayor. So, <laughs> <clears throat> um, so these are the secondary data sets uh, we used. So we have the tower books, and as you see, it's only 61K tokens. As a comparison, uh, the modern, like the modern Flair model for German is trained on half a billion tokens. Um, and uh, then, we have, then we have the most similar data set, which is the law sources from uh, the canton of Fribourg, which is also interrogation protocols like the Tower Books, which uh, is approximately the, sa the, sa the same size. And on the contrary, we have Königsfelden, a monastery, uh, where we have charters, so a very different domain, uh, but many, many more documents available. Um, also, not all of these are annotated. The tower books, the law sources, and the Korgerichtsmanuale, which are court proceedings, have uh, annotations. 
Königsfelden also has annotations, uh, but they use a different concept from where to where to set the spans. And this makes them incompatible with what we have for the tower books. We did do previous experiments for the Königsfelden corpus, if you want to look that up. <laughs> so um, the effects of secondary data. If we apply these small domain close corpora, so the law sources and the court proceedings, we get a increase of 1.3 percentage points, which is pretty fine. Um, adding the large non-domain data, like Königsfelden, uh, did yield basically no increase for us. Uh, and uh, even in, under some parameter settings, uh, even a decrease. Uh, but the biggest impact, the most, uh, the most important thing was to just have more named entity annotated training data. Um, uh, we are a long way away from uh, being at the end of that. So uh, just with this, where we basically tripled the training data using these two additionally, we already got a plus 3.1 percentage point score over the baseline. Then we performed some data augmentation. One was uh, simple sentence splitting, just from uh, just saying uh, basically uh, split at periods, but do not split if the sentence is shorter, would be shorter than 10 tokens, and uh, always split if the sentence would be longer than 100 tokens. This is because the uh, LSTM architecture gets worse and worse the longer se the sequence is. Mm. So um, uh, we did observe uh, significant improvements by doing that between one and three percentage points. Also, inconsistent capitalization was a problem. This is not a problem for all editions, but for ours, it was. And uh, we basically added a copy of the training data, but all lowercased. So basically, the feature of capitalization was less strong, and we got a percentage point uh, to our score that way. These are the best. Uh, scores, we can, uh, we could report in the end. You see, as Krista said, organizations are just so inconsistently annotated. Uh, there were very little guidelines for the students to follow, as far as I know, so uh, the scores are very low. But interestingly enough, you see, can see here, the bottom line is uh, basically a second human annotator, how she scored compared to the first one, the more uh, expert one. And uh, the machine actually beat her, basically, against the test set. <laughs> uh, and yes, we are pretty content with these scores, because uh, I can remind you, so modern German gets around 90 percentage at the moment for NER. Then here, a small example, how uh, it performs on automated, uh, automatic text recognition. So, um, this is uh, from a model uh, that is not particularly well fine-tuned. Uh, Tobias, do you know what uh, character error rate that model has? For Did we test it? So 6%, pretty high. Um, uh, but still, the NER was, still, uh, was able to find all the entities in this paragraph. Uh, the two persons, even with the errors, were found. It found, uh, it found all the places. Um, and it also found the city of Bern, even though it was written the wrong way. <laughs> it was uh, recognized as Gern, um, probably due to the context. This is the advantage uh, with the context embeddings, uh, because the Herren von usually follows a place. <laughs> so in conclusion, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's ob pretty obvious, but still more data usually improves the models. But that's not the only thing. It should also be data that fits the domain well. Uh, uh, and uh, also the data quality and preparation are extremely important. Um, uh, yeah, this is more like a general call. Please share your data and your taggers, uh, uh, especially in the historian's community. Please share all the stuff you have <laughs> so we can use it. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, Flare is just really, really good at handling inconsistent vocabularies. Um, and we hope that one day we have enough data to train a good BERT model. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think uh, that's it. Thank you for listening.